so here at the University of Iowa Libraries, uh, we are really pleased that we are the home of Nicholas Meyer's papers, uh, his collection of writings and letters and photographs, all sorts of stuff. So we have letters in our files from as early as 1979 discussing uh, his collection. Fast forward a couple years and several very successful films to 1983, and the first batch of papers arrived here in Iowa City. So they've been here for quite a while now. Uh, and since then, Nick's collection has grown steadily to become today one of the preeminent archives of film and television in our time. If you spend any time with a collection, which I invite all of you to do, uh, we're on the third floor of this building, uh, and you can come anytime, uh, it reveals a writer and filmmaker of extraordinary breadth who has contributed immensely to our popular and literary culture. It shines with insight, provocation, and humor, and has been used by students and researchers literally from around the globe. Tonight, however, we are fortunate to be able to, to spend some time not with the collection, but instead with its creator and subject. Currently serving as a writer and contributing producer on the upcoming Star Trek series, debuting next year, and with many other creative projects to his credit and in the works, it is my honor to introduce Nicholas Meyer. Thank you, and please note the exit nearest you before we <laughs> go any further. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be back at the University of Iowa. Uh, this was, as I like to tell people, the first place in my life that I was truly happy. I live in California where there's no water, <laughs> and so everything is very yellow, and we also have earthquakes. So to see all this green, and to stand again on terracotta <laughs> this, this is going to be a tough room I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I sense it okay that was um, a, a couple of uh, caveats here one is um, I can't really talk about the new series or because we'd have to introduce um, <laughs> Then, then I would have to kill you. And <laughs> um, I also can't talk about the new Time After Time television series on ABC, uh, or I'd have to kill myself. <laughs> um, so we'll talk about something else. My, my, the the uh, title of my talk, and I don't know if you, if you saw the title, it's, it's called the, the Man Who Understood Everything Last. Memory is a funny thing. We may feel quite certain that events fell out as we remember them, but documents and photographs sometimes tell another story. What is here before you, these papers, may not be the total truth, but it is part of the truth, and on occasion these pages contradict my certain recollections. And by the way, I just had another instance of this outside when I bumped into my former boss at the Mars Cafe. <laughs> it no longer exists. It was Mars Cafe food from out of this world. That was a super cafe. <laughs> and I distinctly remember that this restaurant stood on the corner of Washington and Clinton Street. And he showed me a photograph that it was like three places to the left of where I remembered it, so <laughs> caveat emptor. <laughs> since the beginning, which is to say since my beginning, I have always had difficulty understanding what was going on. My brain peculiarity affected not only my academic performance, mezzo mezzo, but also my ability to parse interpersonal exchanges, whether social or in the workplace. I didn't discover that I had ADD issues, because no one knew what it was, 
uh, until I was in my 40s when I joined a daughter of mine to be tested. More recently, Iowa City's own Nancy Andreassen had a look at my brain. <laughs> she hasn't been the same since. <laughs> Ask her. <laughs> this lack of analytic acumen may well have contributed to my inability to understand what was important or cool about the Star Trek television series when it first aired in the late 60s. At that time, I was an undergraduate here at the university. At that time, and for years afterward, Star Trek held no interest for me whatsoever. The goofy Dr. Denton outfits, the cardboard sets, the idiotic leprous alien makeup, including an actor with absurd pointy ears, <laughs> all these struck me as ridiculous. They bore no resemblance to any reality with which I was familiar or any fantasy by which I was intrigued. Even the fact that Captain Kirk hailed from the state where I was attending school failed to impress me with Star Trek's value, though I've since learned <laughs> This is my favorite joke coming up. <laughs> that Keokuk is seriously considering changing its name to Keokuk. from Keokuk. So I've spent a lifetime being puzzled as to what precisely is so appealing about the show to so many people. Indeed, instead of disappearing after its initial telecasts, Star Trek has bewilderingly persisted and gathering grown like Topsy, um, gathering more fans and adherents so much so that over a decade later, the studio that owned the show felt compelled to develop a feature film employing the original cast, a group of disparate and relative unknowns whom fate had mysteriously joined at the hip in an alchemy that, to use a Spock-like expression, defied logic. By the way, I don't know if ever have you have ever seen the greatest Star Trek movie of all. It's called Galaxy Quest. <laughs> Okay, let's get serious. <laughs> you may not be aware, or you may, but many scientists working for NASA were inspired to join the space agency as the result of childhood exposure to Star Trek. Not Star Wars, Star Trek. <laughs> George Lucas, eat your heart out. That's okay. <laughs> the series continued success, even though the first film derived from it was deemed a failure, albeit a profitable one. The series and its premise continued to sprout like mushrooms there were and continue to be more feature films, more TV, and spin-offs. Star Trek unquestionably now merits the label franchise. The original characters can now boast that hackneyed and overused adjective, iconic. That cast has been succeeded by countless others, some by now boasting Shakespearean credentials. <laughs> Eventually, even the spin-offs had spin-offs, and presently a brand new reboot of the feature series is in theaters, and Star Trek will soon inaugurate the forthcoming CBS streaming service with Star Trek as their flagship offering. I know all this because, strange as it may seem, I am now working on the new series, and despite all my years of relative confusion and ambivalence about Star Trek and its premise, I have worked on three of the feature films. And by the way, this, this ambivalence is obviously not limited to me. Leonard Nimoy wrote a 
book once called I Am Not Spock, and then 20 years later wrote another book, I Am Spock. So. <laughs> I rest my case. I rest it here. As I am also the author of three Sherlock Holmes pastiches, it is perhaps unavoidable for me to draw comparisons with the author of that other durable franchise, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Doyle could write Sherlock Holmes, but he appears to have been curiously obtuse as, the reason behind, as to the reasons behind Holmes' popularity. He could do it, but he didn't get it. Like Doyle, I could do Star Trek, but I didn't get it. As I said at the beginning of this talk, I am the last man to understand anything. Someone told me once that there are three ways in which people take in information. They take it in via their eyes, via their ears, and their pores. It is only now, in the latter part of my life, that I am finally able to glimpse the true meaning and importance of Star Trek. Though intellectually I was able to perceive long since that Star Trek was not concerned with any form of science, but rather like the best of science fiction, with reflections upon our present Earth-centric predicaments. By clothing these issues in alien nomenclature and different sartorial embellishments and trappings, Star Trek attempts to help us see ourselves more objectively than if the Klingons had simply been labeled, oh, say, Russians. <laughs> I must have grasped some of this intuitively, if not intellectually, early on. Wait, there's a typo. Well, I'll fix it later. Um, <laughs> it's hard to, you know, when you see it. Uh, as I say, I, I must have grasped this intuitively, if not intellectually, early on when trying to figure out the screenplay for what became The Wrath of Khan, I realized that Star Trek did remind me of something that I loved, which was the Captain Horatio Hornblower novels of C.S. Forrester, which chronicle the rousing exploits of that British naval officer during the Napoleonic Wars who had an attractive alien in every port. Subsequently, I was tickled to learn that Star Trek's creator, Gene Roddenberry, had modeled Kirk on Hornblower, even as Forrester modeled Hornblower on uh, Admiral Lord Nelson. So my first venture into Star Trek was to heighten the resemblance between Roddenberry's universe and Forrester's. Kirk would be Hornblower in outer space, complete with bosun's whistles, running out the guns on battleships or torpedoes on submarines, if you prefer. But while the Wrath of Khan experience may have enabled me to create Star Trek in my own image and to my own preferences and to my own satisfaction, I still had not cracked the mystery of the series' galvanizing appeal. It has also been noted, though not by me to be sure, that embedded in the Star Trek ethos is the premise and promise of optimism, of possibility. People need encouragement. We need to believe this mysterious business we call life adds up to something, has potential, has meaning. Star Trek works on this pleasing presumption. I think I understood this concept in theory for some time. I understood it intellectually. I had seen it with my eyes, heard it with my ears. But it is only of late that the insight has entered through arguably my most important receptor, my pores. I feel a little like that cluster of Team Dorothy 
like the scarecrow, I should have understood it with my brain, like the tin woodman, I should have grasped it with my heart, etc., etc., etc. But no, as the good witch Glinda observes of Dorothy, she had to learn it for herself. So it is with pleasure and no small feeling of humility that I can acknowledge today that the purpose and value of Star Trek are now, at long last, clear to me. It may be that I do not yet grasp the entire picture, what a tedious business life would be if we could all do that out of the box every time, and you can be sure that ain't me. But I can honestly report that it is my pleasure to be present at this exhibit of some of my work in connection with this singular and mysterious cultural phenomenon and of the phenomenon in general on this the happy 50th anniversary of that wonderful creation. Thank you. couple things. Uh, Nick has agreed to answer some questions, uh, so I will circulate with this microphone so that w everybody can hear the question and so that our speaker can hear the question. After uh, we wrap up uh, with that, um, there will be a table out in the lobby here uh, where we can have some things signed and uh, there will be staff out there to direct you uh, where to form the line. So keep an eye out for that. So questions. Yes. Hi, welcome back to Iowa. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to know how you chose the University of Iowa to go to college. Um, as I said to you earlier, I was not a good student. I went to a very fancy private school in New York. A lot of important people went there. <laughs> I was not one of them. <laughs> um, and they all got very good grades, and I didn't. Um, and nobody could quite understand why, because I talked a good game, and I, 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 I seemed like I was smart. But it's like, and they said, you have problems focusing. You're lazy. You lack discipline, whatever. I was perfectly good at focusing on the things that interested me. <laughs> and I have a memory like flypaper, notwithstanding I got the Mars Cafe in the wrong place, but <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. I can put you to sleep reciting Richard III, or, it, but it didn't, you know, that's they, not what they wanted. So the question is, what was of interest to me? What was interest to me of theater, movies, literature, writing? And my college advisor, a man whose name I well remember, Howard Nomer said, there's only one school in the whole country that does everything you want. So I came out here to visit it, and I immediately sort of fell in love with the campus, and you had taken a, a, an exam to get into it, and, and Jessup Hall was an exam. And my father, who was a very sophisticated, very urbane guy, who was a Harvard graduate, you know, and uh, he was a psychoanalyst. He was a very cultivated man. He said, my boy, <laughs> do you know what there is between New York and California? He said, well, there's nothing but a big hole with corn growing <laughs> around the fringe. <laughs> and I said, we shall see. <laughs> and I noticed on the bulletin board in Jessup Hall that there were still tickets available to the Budapest String Quartet. And I said, this, this is me. And that's how I got here. Sorry, I just also wanted to say that um, our son also has ADHD and has had a really difficult time the last couple you know of years. Did you know that ADD people are more successful than yes. other people? Yes. <laughs> and, and, and my son is quite the genius as well. 
I, wouldn't, I lay no claim to genius, but I, I used to tell people that I was telling somebody that I had a C-plus average, and, and my wife, who was a 4.0 A everything student, used to say, it's the plus that's really the pathetic part, don't you think? <laughs> Yes. Thank you for coming to Iowa again. The last time I saw you was in 1979 when I was a little younger, but you don't seem to have changed. <laughs> what did you find You've more challenging? You've seen Avatar. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> what did you find more challenging to write for, a franchise like Star Trek or a novelization like Time After Time? Well, first of all, I never thought of Star Trek as a franchise, and it wasn't a franchise for, to me, because I didn't watch the TV show. They, sh they showed me uh, some episodes. Harv Bennett, my late friend and the producer of it, showed me some episodes. He watched all of them. I said, oh, I, I can't. You know. uh, and I, they showed me S Space Seed, and they showed me the first movie. And I thought, could I make a better movie with half the amount of money they spent. And I thought, well, you know, I'd look good if I even, you know, came close. And, and I, it was only a quarter of the amount of the first, you know, budget. And my recollection, and by the way, recollection is tricky. You know, I, I, especially if anything to do with me, I, I'll get it wrong. Uh, as, I, as I found out looking at my collection, I'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, my recollection is that I was pretty much left alone to make this movie, to write the script, which is a weird way how it got written. Nobody was in a way paying a lot of attention. And certainly there was no internet connection with fans. I didn't, you know, people, did you hear from fans? I said, I don't think, you know, I got, one showed me a letter, you know, if Spock dies, you die. <laughs> Somebody had, had really there's caught the Trek spirit. Yeah. There's quite a few letters from fans in the collection. Quite a few. What, the, the, the thing about the collection, which is interesting, and I, I should plug my memoir, which, which if you haven't read it, it's a masterpiece. Uh, it's called The View from the Bridge, Memories of Star Trek and a Life in Hollywood. And the first thing that the first page is about is the imperfection of memory. And I found this out. Because people said, oh, did you work with Gene Roddenberry on The Wrath of Khan? Did you meet him or anything? And I said, well, yeah, I, I met him. I met him. I think everybody shook his hand or you kissed the ring or something. And, <laughs> and, uh, but I, I don't think I had any interaction with him. And then some years ago, I came back to look at an exhibition of my papers, and I see this lengthy, typewritten, irate correspondence between me and Gene Roddenberry about my script. He never liked any of my Star Trek script. And, and, and there was in black and white not what I remembered at all. Um, so, I, so the first part of your question is, I never thought about it as a franchise. And in fact, when I look at The Wrath of Khan, and we should say parenthetically that artists are not the best judges of their own work. You know, it's like, if any of you have artists, you'll know you lose all proprietary authority over your creation when it's finished. You've put the message in the bottle, put the cork in the bottle, you throw the bottle out there, and it's out, and people are going to pop the cork and read the, what's inside and make of it what they will, but you're not going to be leaning over their shoulder saying, no, that's not gum, that's gun, <laughs> interpreting it for them. And so my opinion is just one of many opinions now. But my opinion about the Wrath of Khan, for what it's worth, is that it sort of exists in a world by itself, as far as I'm concerned. It's sort of sui generis. There's a lot of Latin in this talk tonight. <laughs> I, I got a C in Latin. Um, not, a, not a C plus. <laughs> I differ from... George Washington, George could not tell a lie. I can, but I won't. All right. Um, anyway, so that, that's how I worked on the Star Trek thing. The, um, what was the other one we were talking about? Is it challenging to work with novelization? 
Oh, well, I don't, I, time after time, I assume, is what you're talking about. Yeah, time after time has an interesting history, which is also connected with Iowa. Because the person who wrote the, what was the novel was a man named Carl Alexander, who was at the writer's workshop. That's where I knew him from. And after the 7% solution was on the New York Times bestseller list and there was the movie, and I was hearing from a lot of people from my life, and Carl lived in Los Angeles, um, and he said, I'm writing a novel that is kind of inspired by yours. I have 65 pages and an outline. Would you read it and give me a critique? And back in those days, when you had time, I said, sure. So I read it. And I had all kinds of issues with it. But the one issue I didn't have with it was, gee, what a swell idea that you would never have had in 10 trillion years, because I don't get ideas. And when I do, they usually stink. So I met with him, and I had a long colloquy where I gave him a whole bunch of notes. And then I forgot about it, except I couldn't forget about it. And I thought, how weird is this? He thinks it's a book. I know it's a movie. It's two guys in Victorian outfits running around San Francisco. How much could it cost? They'll let me direct this. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not being the sharpest knife in the drawer, it took me about three months to wake up and say, shit, man, option his book. <laughs> Hello? So I optioned his book. And I wrote the screenplay in something like six days. Why? It's, a deception. it's deceptive to say to somebody, how long did it take you to write something? Because in my case, the writing is all about thinking about it. And I had three months to <laughs> think about it. Opens here, it goes there, whatever. whatever. So I, I wrote the screenplay. And I gave it to Carl. And I said, here, help yourself. Just take whatever you want. Because I thought, if he gets his book published, that's good for the movie. If the movie has a book, it's good for the book, whatever. So it wasn't a novelization. It was never a novelization. It was his novel and my screenplay, and it was, I just wrote it the way I wanted to write it. All right, right down here. Um, I was an army physician stationed in Berlin and was cast as Dark Glasses Number 2 in your movie uh, that you wrote and directed, uh, Company Business. Um, Everybody has to have one flop. Yeah. <laughs> As Dark Glasses number two, I escorted Gene Hackman down a long corridor that was supposed to be the, uh, the, C um, the uh, CIA building. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, the scene was cut from the movie. The movie should have been cut from the movie. <laughs> I'm not saying that you know, it was a disappointment at the box office because my scene was cut. <laughs> but... Aren't you? Anyway, I was wondering uh, how uh, a project like that, that Got was a fine... such a mess? Well, <laughs> part of that, and then being a financial disappointment, how that affected your career, or how you handled projects, uh, perhaps in the future, how that had an effect uh, on your management of your own career. Um, I also heard that part of the plot, I don't know if it's true, but that part of the plot was recycled for Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, at least that's what a movie site once said, so I was curious of that as well, but. That's true. The story behind the excruciating experience that I had, you know they say fun is the past tense of shit. <laughs> so now we can laugh. <laughs> At the time, it wasn't funny, and it certainly affected my career. It certainly did. Um, it came about, the movie came about because I was switching agents. And 
which is not something one, at least not something that I do in a hurry and whatever. I, um, but my agent had died and I even hung on with the same agency for three more years following. And finally I said, you know, I really got to do something in my own interests here. And I was being wooed. I had my choice. And at that time, the most powerful agency in town was CAA, and they were a packaging giant. And I thought, why don't you go with one of these, with an agency that really specializes in packaging, and you know, a movie will get made. And a, a very good friend of mine, Rick Nasita, was an agent there. And another good friend of mine, Fred Spector, was an agent there. Fred is still there. Uh, Rick is out of the agency business, but he was there for like 30 years or something. And they said, great, come to us. And Rick said, why don't you write an original screenplay? Just write something. So I had been very fascinated by the end of the Cold War and the busting up of the, so you know, I'd done the day after, so I was, this was all part of my, where my head was at. And I was fascinated by what was on CNN and how much information. And I thought, who needs spies? You just watch that, and you find out whatever. And that was back when they were, you know, doing journalism. And <laughs> as Mark Twain said, it would be hilarious if it weren't mortal. <laughs> anyway, um, so I wrote about a spy swap gone wrong in which a Russian and an American find themselves on the run in a world in which they are ideologically as well as technologically obsolete. And, and the key line, which is interesting, was never in the movie, was the CIA guy saying to the Russian guy, so where'd you get your information? You, you had a mole in the DOD, didn't you? And he goes, no, CNN. <laughs> that was the idea of it. So I, I wrote an early draft of this, and I said to Rick Nasita, what you, something like this? And he said, yeah, that's really good. And the next thing you know, I got a phone call from Fred Spector saying, what do you think about Gene Hackman to be the American? And I said, well, yeah, you know, I got to finish the script, but he'd be really good. He says, you got him. I said, I, I got him? He says, you got him. What do you think about Mikhail Baryshnikov as the Russian? <laughs> and the name of the movie at, this, at that moment, which I, I couldn't keep the title, was Dinosaurs. That was the name of the movie. And I said, well, he's, he's, he's a little young to be a dinosaur. And Fred said, he got the picture made, Gene Hackman, Mikhail Baryshnikov. I thought, OK, why the fuck did you go to CAA anyway? I said, OK. And then I tried to meet Gene Hackman. I thought that was like a normal thing to do. And Gene Hackman, between the time he agreed to do the movie and the time it was time to make the movie, sandwiched in three movies back to back. He did Postcards from the Edge, Class Action, Narrow Margin. And, and I could never get near him. And this worried me. And I thought, I'm going to have a 60-year-old man who doesn't want to, he's going to be exhausted. And you know, I, I could meet Baryshnikov, and Baryshnikov wanted to do the movie because he thought Gene Hackman was the greatest actor, and that made it interesting to him. Gene Hackman was interested in doing the movie because he admired Baryshnikov so much and whatever. Well, it was a troika that was just pulling in all different directions, and events on the, on the global stage were unfolding so fast that the screenplay could never keep up. I was like, you know, if you're the writer-director, you don't want to be rewriting the movie when you're supposed to be preparing the movie, and you don't want to be preparing the movie when you need to keep rewriting it. So I was always behind the eight ball. I never met, I met Baryshnikov. Uh, I never met Gene Hackman until like two weeks before the movie's supposed to happen, and he said he didn't want to do it. He said, replace me. And Laddie, who was 
the head of MGM at the time said, I'm not replacing you and you have a contract. So he showed up in Berlin, his first time we met. And he wasn't happy about being there. So it was, I, I don't want to, you know, sort of go into a chapter and verse because the night is still young. <laughs> um, but whatever was going on, I utterly failed to control it. The script utterly failed to keep pace with events. And it was a troika that was just pulling off in real different directions. That's the short version. <laughs> All right, I'm going to head up back here. Summon it back. Questions? And I'm coming back down. <laughs> coming back down. Oh, let's go right on the edge. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming in today. Um, my question is, what did you think of Star Trek Into Darkness and how it reinterpreted and like remixed Wrath of Khan? Um, I will s say a couple of things. The first thing I have to say is that I've known J.J. since I used to read him bedtime stories. <laughs> I was at his bar mitzvah. He came up to me five or six years ago in the Fox Commissary and he said, do you remember what you gave me for my bar mitzvah? And I said, no. He said, you gave me the annotated Sherlock Holmes. And my son is reading it now. So it was the gift that kept on giving. There is no question in my mind that he is an enormously talented guy. That's indisputable. Whether you know, somebody said, oh, this isn't your grandfather's Star Trek. Star Trek appears to me to be a bottle into which you can pour, you know, each filmmaker or writer or whatever, puts their own vintage in there. Or to take another example, which I sometimes use, it's a little bit like the text of the Catholic Mass. Different people have set it to music. Or the Mozart Coronation Mass does not sound like the Verdi Requiem, which does not sound like the Haydn Mass in Time of War. It's all the same words, but the music is different. Having said that, J.J.'s Star Trek movies are not mine. And they emerge from a different sensibility. I don't understand a Star Trek where Spock is beating the shit out of people. It doesn't seem like, well, well, yeah, but you see, we're all old, you know. <laughs> I, w on one level, I'm extremely flattered that they stole my whole script. <laughs> but what is the difference between a an homage and a ripoff. I think you have to add something to make it an homage. You have to take it to another place. And I, I, I was enormously flattered by the fact that they in some way felt they couldn't do better than this. But I think they should have. Thank you. It's great to see you here. I want to quote a line of Technobabble from one of your very first movies. This is from... <laughs> <coughs> and I'd like an explanation. <laughs> this is from Invasion of the Bee Girls. One of the characters tries to explain the mystery away. Quote, Maybe the antigen and estrogen hormones were artificially substituted by androgynous hormones, thereby rearranging the cellular structure. Well, the short answer is that I didn't write the line. <laughs> ah. uh, we might as well get this story on the record. <laughs> uh, the 
first assignment I ever got when I drove to Los Angeles to seek my fortune in making movies, I somehow got to meet these two producers and they said, they, had, they were on the lot at Warner Brothers. <laughs> I was so thrilled, you know. Um, I didn't have my name on the parking space. It said, you know, like, um, guest writer or I, you know, something transitory about it. Um, they said, we want to make a horror movie where the men and not the women are victims. <laughs> and I thought, that is a laudable undertaking, in my opinion. Sure. Because I remembered a letter written by a woman who had seen Alfred Hitchcock's Frenzy and wrote to the New York Times and said, once, just once, I'd like to see the man's eyes widen with fear. <laughs> and I thought, okay, lady, this for you. <laughs> So I wrote this movie, which, was, which I called The Honey Factor. That was the name of the movie. And it was about a think tank in the desert with a lot of bright, bored people who, when they weren't doing you know, research, were having affairs or whatever. And all the men start dropping dead as a result of sexual intercourse. And the women become rosy and redolent with health. <laughs> and the men have to start using the buddy system at night. And <laughs> <laughs> and I thought this was a really good movie because <laughs> it could either play Cinema One, which was the chic theater on 61st and 3rd, or it could play the Paramus Drive-In. Didn't matter, because there was something for everybody in it. <laughs> and then I made a big mistake. Do not go to visit your parents during pre-production. <laughs> That's the most important thing you can take away from here tonight. <laughs> take away that. Because I came back, and the producer said, you know, um, we're, we're in prep now. And and uh, a screenplay is really like a blueprint for a house, isn't it? I mean, uh, when you think about it. Because as you get closer to, you know, as you start to build, you realize you may need a window here that you didn't have, and a couple plugs, a couple outlets that weren't, you know. And uh, I said, yeah, OK, I understand that. He said, well, you weren't here, you know, so we had to do s something else. And I said, oh, OK. I said, could I, could I read the script? He said, of course. Hands me the screenplay, which is now called Invasion of the Bee Girls, not the Honey Factor anymore. And it says, screenplay by Nicholas Meyer and Sylvia something. And I, I said, who is, is Sylvia, what's her name? Well, it turned out it was his girlfriend, <laughs> which, whom he had promised credit co-credit, you know, to do this rewrite. And which he didn't have the authority to do because the Writers Guild, not producers and not studios, decides who gets the credit. So he was already a, a kind of a, a mumser for even doing that. And I read it. And simply put, they took out all the Cinema One parts and just left in the Paramus Drive-In. <laughs> <laughs> and the dialogue that, which you accuse me of writing. <laughs> <laughs> There's more to this story. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I've never seen the movie, let's put it that way. Uh, and people have helpfully sent me the DVD, so don't you dare. <laughs> uh, and that was, this is, you know, what I, what I learned. Uh, don't visit your parents during prep. Just <laughs> don't do it, um, even if it's over Christmas. Two more quick follow-ups. I have projected this film. I'm sorry. We brought honeycomb <laughs> in and passed out pieces of honeycomb to the audience. Do you know how hard it is to wrap up 16 millimeter fi film when your fingers are sticky? And finally, I was going to compare this complexity to your most famous line in films, one syllable. Con! 
All right, it, one more question if anyone has a burning question. We'll take it in the back and then we will wrap up. Thanks, I don't know if this is a burning question, but. Um, is it a burning question? Is it a burning question? Okay. I'm curious, five or six years ago when you were in town, you mentioned, uh, we talked a little bit about George Washington, and I was just curious, I wanted to um, ask if, uh, you know, what, uh, what that project was going like for you, and if you could say a little bit about your interest in Washington. Um, when I was a kid, we used to drive up the Hudson River West Side Highway to visit my grandparents in White Plains, and we would pass what then I was, could, you could make a real argument, was the most beautiful suspension bridge in the world. It was the George Washington Bridge before they put the lower layer on it which was known as Martha. <laughs> that, was, that was what they, they, you know, it was to accommodate heavy, tr you know. But driving up the West Side Highway, my dad would tell me stories about George Washington and the American Revolution. I just thought it was the greatest thing I'd heard. And in some ways I still do, which makes me exceedingly sad. We seem to have come a long way, baby. Uh, and I just kept reading about the American Revolution. And I always tell people, and I, I think I told your daughter a little earlier, two things. Is the, the American Revolution was the only revolution that was fomented by a clique of geniuses. And it's the only revolution that ever worked. So I got very interested. And what, and just started reading book after book after book. And I, I'm putting my politics on my sleeve here, but when, you know, George W. Bush was elected president, I just kept going back and back and back and back and just I, reading about, and it's not like they were all, heroes are not gods. You know, they have all kinds of flaws and problems, and that makes them, in a way, sort of more heroic. I got a lot of, stick when I wrote The 7% Solution is you depicted Sherlock Holmes as a drug addict. And I said, in the first place, I didn't depict him as a drug addict. Doyle depicts him as a drug addict. And in the second place, you're confusing heroes with gods. That if a man leaps into a raging torrent to save a drowning child, he performs an heroic act. But if the same man leaps into the same torrent, to save the same child and does it with a ball and chain attached to his leg, is he more heroic or less? And I submit that flawed heroes are not only more interesting, uh, but they're more real. And now we only want, you know, caped crusaders. Are, we're so desperate, I'm veering from your question, I realize, to escape the horrors and fears with which we are currently beset that we only want Batman or somebody with the word man at the end of his name to come and straighten it all out, which isn't, by the way, going to get us any place. Um, and Washington was my complete hero. He was the closest, you know, and, and it's, it's not that he didn't own slaves, because he did. But he was the only founding slaveholding father to free his slaves, which he did when he died. Um, and I got really, really interested in him. And I met Paul Allen, who had a lot of money and apparently still does, but he won't <laughs> give me much of it. <laughs> a million, he wouldn't notice a million. <laughs> and then I like, I was shy to ask. Um, but I did say, uh, you know, it would be good, cool to make a movie about George Washington. And there are many stories in that man's life that you could tell. And it's interesting that the father of his country couldn't have children. But he had many surrogate sons, of which Hamilton was, was one. Benedict Arnold was one. Um, Lafayette was probably the, the real son. Um, and they said, well, we want to make a, like a smaller piece, not a big 
sing. So I wrote a movie about what happened the day the last Union Jack disappeared over the horizon in New York Harbor. And it was like, now what? And George Washington had served eight years in this war without a day off and no pay. And he promised his wife, who was raising all the, the children that she had by her children, all these grandchildren, because she had been married before, that he'd be home by Christmas. And he made this royal progress from New York to Mount Vernon, stopping at Annapolis, which was then the capital, to formally surrender his commission. He was a guy who had laid great store by appearances and doing it right, so it would look right. He was obsessed with, how's it going to look? How will it play? And he went back to Mount Vernon, which he was bankrupt. And uh, everybody who was, and he, he promised Martha that he would never go away again. And so he stayed at home and played host to everybody who knocked on the door and said, could I have a lock of your hair, please? <laughs> he said, I am become the Washington Monument. <laughs> and my house has become a tavern. They didn't, he couldn't turn anybody away. He was carrying tea up to house guests at night who had just, you know. And these people were all bringing him tales that the country was falling apart that the Articles of Confederation were not working, that treating each state as if it were a sovereign country with its own cash, its own laws, its own mail system, all that stuff. No European country wanted to do business with us because they didn't know who they were doing business with. The, 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 the currency wasn't even the same. The country he had given his life to was falling apart like Alka-Seltzer. And he decided, and he was very worried, because he was always worried about his reputation, that he was going to call everybody together and tell them we're going to revise the Articles of Confederation. This was a lie. He had no intention of revising the Articles. What do you know? So George Washington could tell a lie. He told a lie. <laughs> and he was going to put his reputation on the line in Philadelphia. May 1787. And they were all supposed to come and like talk about revising the articles. By the way, they didn't all come. Rhode Island never showed. They were having a good need to be there. But when everybody else got there, he locked the door and said, this is different than what I talked about. We're going to start over. And that's the movie I wanted to make. Just everything that led up to that and how they made the Constitution and kept their mouths shut from May to September outside that room about what they were doing. And they would go to the city tavern in Philadelphia. How many people have been to the city tavern? Anybody been yet? That was their, like, their clubhouse. And they're still serving the same, you know, it's fresh, but it's the same. <laughs> Yeah, these, these are the jokes. Anyway, but uh, they, they served the same recipes and all that stuff. And they, and they would go there, and they would not talk about what they were doing in that room. They even kept the windows closed in a Philadelphia summer. So no, and the only person who was like prone to blab when he got drunk was Franklin, who was, he, he's 85. He was 85 years old. He's, he's the only guy whose name is on all three of our birth certificates. Declaration of Independence, Peace of Paris, and the Constitution. And when he would start to allude to what was going on in that room, they would like start telling jokes and, and when somebody would dare somebody else to call George Washington by his first name, which was not a good plan. Um, and, and then at the end, September, they came out and somebody said, well, Dr. Franklin, what have you given us? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. And all political discourse, aren't you glad you took this class? Uh, <laughs> you, you pushed the button. 
Um, all political discourse in this country is a debate about that document. How much is states' rights? How much is this? You know, and it was it was built to make nothing happen. Thank you, Nick.